The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hello, welcome to another edition of The Engine Room. My name is Andrew Rocks and I am in the 150-year-old Newcastle Club about to interview Glenn Reilly. Welcome to the engine room, Glenn. Thanks for having me, Roxy. And look, a, a big shout out. Um, it's probably the most grand sort of uh, um, location that we've ever interviewed. I mean, a sound, sound guy, Kieran, um, he was uh, being told that he needs to be seen, but no, so not seen and not heard <laughs> by the uh, c- constabulary at the front door, which was, which was awesome. It's, uh, it's the way he likes to be. So thank you. No, my bad. I should have mentioned the dress code. Sorry, Kieran. Dress code for sound guys is uh, what you get. Yeah. So. <laughs> We've known each other for some years, and I've been really looking forward to um, to this particular podcast, Engine Room, because you've got a very definitive and, and strong way in which you speak about the service offering that you do. You've got a great track record. Um, and I, just to bring uh, the listeners up to speed, it'd be great to get a feel for, you know, how you've got to this point in your life in, in the context of financial planning and anything else that sort of tickles your fancy. So sure. maybe take us through your backstory, please. Yeah. Well, I'll take you back to the beginning about 1994. We're in a, uh, a an old English pub in a village called Ledsham in the north uh, of Yorkshire. And a friend of mine, Martin, sat me down and over a pint of Guinness, he was an advisor with Pearl Assurance over there and he helped me set some short, medium and long-term goals. I was playing professional football league back then and I loved what he did for me. I'm very goal-oriented and I said to him, mate, I want to have a look at this. I'm playing professional sport, I'm training two hours a day and I've got a lot of free time. Fast forward six months and I was an advisor with Allied Dunbar over in the UK, Um, still playing professional sport. There's a first grade squad of 22 players and every Tuesday, Thursday, Friday night after training, I would meet one of the players in the cocked hat at Sheffield uh, Arena. Not a metaphor, everyone. That was actually a, 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 a location. <laughs> it was a location over the road from the from the training ground. And I would teach the boys how to save first and spend second. So that was how it all kind of kicked off. Being in a team was a great environment. There's a lot of people that trusted me that I was spending a lot of time with. So all of the players became clients and then some of the sponsors and the directors. And it rolled on from there. And the one thing that I kind of learned early was around... Uh, not letting rejection impact me. So pros- I loved prospecting. I'd be filling my car up and somebody would pull up next to me in a Porsche. And before he finished filling his car up, I'd be giving him a business card. And on the way in, the guy behind the counter, he got a business card. And I was 20 years of age. Uh, and so there were no rules. I'd got no preconceptions as to how this should work. Um, and that's how I kind of built a, a business over there. Um, and, and look, I'm getting... Ted Lasso vibes here as, uh, <laughs> as far as trying to picture yourself sitting down with these, uh, um, you know, professional athletes and, and trying your best as one of them yeah. to relate to them, but also to, to really help them out post their career. Yeah. 
Yeah, and you know what? It was hard work. They, they were great guys, and I loved them all. But trying to get them to budget, trying to get them to put something away for you know a, a, a retirement goal um, was was super hard. So I soon learned that professional sports people weren't my target client. Um, I moved to Australia, um, found AMP, joined them in 1997, and again I started off building this very general business. If you had a, a pulse, you were a prospect. Um, I didn't know anybody over here, so I had to get really good at asking for referrals. And whereabouts um, did you move in Australia? Straight to Newcastle. Newcastle, yeah, okay. Straight to Newcastle. So my folks moved out here a year before, left me here, uh, left me back in the UK, and uh, I came out a year later and, um, and loved the place. Uh, uh, it's a great spot. Um, so starting from scratch with no school friends, no work colleagues, um, it was a bit of a challenge, but um, asking for referrals was the, the key that really helped me to grow the business. Um, but take you forwards maybe uh, three years or so, and now the AMP model back then was you find a client who has a need, you organize their superannuation or sell them some insurance, you throw them out the back and you go and find somebody else. But you had to do a three-page customer advice record. We did. That was, was rigorous. It, it was rigorous. There wasn't a lot in that in, from a compliance standpoint, but what I soon found was that I didn't want to build a business of scale. I wanted to build a, a business of margin and do more with less. So it's more Pareto's law. So by about- That's two- wild because that, that, that was almost against AMP's model. It was. When you look at the other large practices. Yeah. Um, so I'm very interested in at what stage the, the, the clash of the ideologies happens. I imagine you're about to regale us. Yeah, yeah. Well, what happened was I was finding I could add a lot more value to those small business owners mm-hmm. that I had a, a much stronger relationship with. And I started just charging them a fixed fee, and it was $500 a month back then in about 2001. And it slowly evolved from there. And the more that I did for them, the more value and the, and the stronger the relationship became. And um, I turned into kind of their one throat to choke when it came to legal tax, asset protection, philanthropy, insurance, retirement planning. And that role of the principal advisor started to kind of unfold there. Um, I sold all of the clients bar 20 and um, I bought another practice with quite a, a decent chunk of funds under management and a, a still a fairly small number of clients. And again, the Pareto's law unfolded where 80% of the revenue was coming from the top 20 clients. Mm-hmm. Bring on 2009, and I'm working 50 hours a week. Um, we'd just gone through the GFC. It was hard. Um, I wasn't as passionate about the business that I was building and growing at that point. I was two hours north from my family, and I engaged a coach, Brian Fitzpatrick, who sat on my left shoulder for for many, many years, for the best part of, I reckon, 15 years. And Brian was part of the Fitzpatrick's group. And um, we we talked about the vision that I wanted to build for my practice and the vision and the goal that I set back then in 2009. I said, Brian, I want to work four days a week, 40 weeks a year. And so he really helped me and held me accountable around the kind of clients that we engaged, the work that we did. And then through working with guys like Scott Fitzpatrick, who founded Fitzpatrick's and John Woodley, likewise, they really helped me to change my mindset where I wanted to go and buy all these businesses and and, and instead of taking on, again, lots more clients, really do more with less and be that principal advisor. Was there a moment? Was there a sort of a catalyst or is it just a slow burn um, associated with the uh, the bang for buck working that long? Yeah, you know what? I just got tired and worn yeah. out of all that those hours on the freeway, all the demerit points. And um, yeah, it, it just the, it wore away at me being away from the family. So I decided I wanted to do uh, to do more with less. So again, I sold that practice. I kept the top 25 families from that practice, mm-hmm. which together with the initial one that I had, that those clients seeded the um, the Newcastle business. And um, I think one of the, the key things that I did that really was instrumental in helping me to grow the business was actually taking on my first advisor. In about 2009, I employed Will Howard, who's been with me now for about 14 years. And I transitioned all of my largest client relationships, my most important client relationships to Will. That's a real art, isn't it? I mean, it is. my 
my background, um, roughly the same vintage, started in 94 and it was around that time that, that, that I transitioned and um, it's scary. But it's also, it's scary for two reasons. One is you, you're worried that the client um, won't get on well with the new person and then then you realise they get on very well and maybe you weren't as good Correct. as what you thought and Correct. they're better. And so, you know, I think you go through the cycles and you get to acceptance. So yeah. Um, yeah. is that your It, it was, you know, my, my initial thoughts on day one when I was considering this strategy was no one's going to do this job better than I can or care as much as I can likewise. And I soon realised that Will could do the job just as, as good as I could and nowadays better. Correct. Because I'm off the tools altogether nowadays. But it really helped me to have more time to work on the business instead of in the business. So, yep. and what year was this? That was two thousand nine, and 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 that's the same time that that the uh, the the, Fit, the Fitz team and, and John Woodley were starting to coach you. Was that right? Yes, and that, they started coaching me probably uh, closer to about two thousand and six. And were I, you part of Fitz back then? Because when did you go from A and P to to um, across? So I, I acquired uh, the business on the Mid North Coast in two thousand five. Got it. And that was when I first met Scott Fitzpatrick, and he helped really change the direction that I was heading, wanting to go and acquire more businesses and grow by acquisition to taking that lead advisor approach and doing more with less. So he was kind of sitting on the other shoulder um, and uh, and John Woodley likewise, helping steer the business to, to the business that we, we've got today where we've got the three advisors, each with about 75 families that they each look after. And um, it's about that family CFO model. So um, collaborating and leading their other professionals. Okay. And... Um where you've, where you've found yourself today, um, you're in a wonderful office um, overlooking the harbour there in Newcastle, which, are, which I imagine part of that is the aspirational one. You've probably also uh, ridden the real gentrification of Newcastle that, that, that has come from, you know, BHP Steelworks. Definitely. Um, I was at university back in the early 90s and, and now there's a lot of accomplished, self-employed, very wealthy people here. And um, I, I imagine that that's assisted your your prospecting. It certainly has, yeah. You'd be surprised in, in a small town like Newcastle, the number of wealthy entrepreneurs that you come across that have done really well. So it's um, the growth and development of Newcastle, even across the skyline now. There's lots of cranes, lots of development along Honeysuckle where we are. And um, yeah, there's some trendy bars that you generally usually find in Melbourne or Sydney popping up and great restaurants. So shout out to the coal loader. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Now, so it's, it's a great spot. And uh, having said that, we've acquired three more businesses since that one in 2005. They've been, two of them have been Sydney based. So we are spending a fair bit of time in Sydney um, and then one in the Hunter Valley. And, and that's really been, I think, a key strategy for us. We've always grown strongly organically, but the acquisition opportunity um, has really helped us to find great clients and transition strong relationships from the retiring principal across to our advisors. I think one of the key learnings that I that I've learned from that was in twenty in two thousand five, I was the advisor I took on the clients when I acquired. In two thousand and eighteen Paddy Ryan retired. He'd been with, with Fitzpatrick's for 20 years. He really wanted me to be the advisor, but I, I knew that I had to bring Selena in, who um, was a great new advisor at that stage, but she didn't have a lot of client experience at that stage. She was a strategy advisor in Sydney with a, a firm down there. Um, and so it was harder for me to let go of those clients because they'd been with me for the first year. She'd been there in all the meetings, but it was a much bigger challenge for the clients to unhook from me and build that relationship with her. So maybe one of the key learnings is if you had your time again, and, and there'll be people listening who um, have been on both sides of that equation, yeah. um, either the, the, the purchasing um, principal or alternatively the new associate advisor coming through, would you have changed it and 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 – Got Selena involved earlier or yeah, what's your thoughts? I would. And I did. In this last 12 months, we've acquired two practices. So a, a North Sydney business and a Hunter Valley practice. And the, the entree on the day to the initial client that's walking in for the first time that has been a client of that business for some time would be the principal that's retiring would give us a great rap. In both cases, I knew them and I'd, I'd worked with them for many, many years. Uh, but they would transition their trust 
from themselves to ourselves. And I'd explain to the clients, look, I'll be across your file, but not in the day to day. Selena or Will or Rachel, they'll be the ones holding your hand, implementing the strategy, taking care of you and feeling your calls. I'll be here across it, but not in the day to day. And in this last year, that's worked really well because we've onboarded 80 new clients and um, they're not stuck on me and they're not asking for me. They've been positioned so that that's your advisor and that's who you go to. Oh, that's that's building a business, you know, and this is the engine room. So um, what I wanted to um, – you've probably already started on, on my next kind of theme of, of the podcast, which is learning and getting some of the, the, the detail of how you run your business so that the listeners can get a feel for, um, you know, maybe, maybe what they're doing versus what you're doing and, and get some learnings. So – You've mentioned a few times that you've been acquiring. Um, how do you fund that? Um, it's all bank funded at this stage. It's been bank funded to date. There's facilities with my dealer group, Fitzpatrick's, that are there and available. But to date, um, I've just um, set that up with bank funding. And um, look, you've mentioned uh, Fitzpatrick's. <laughs> you've uh, uh, you've obviously you know spoken quite affectionately about um, the, the founders giving you coaching, and um, they're your current AFSL. They are. Yep. Very happy. There's a great community. It's a national partnership that we're building. There's a bit of an evolution right now because as you're probably aware, dealer groups aren't all that profitable. And so um, right now, Fitzpatrick's have kind of pivoted and they're now an investor in good businesses across Australia. So they've taken equity in my practice, um, in a lot of the larger practices within the group. There's a fair bit of consolidation happening right now. We want to ensure as the principles of these businesses that if you as a client walk into our Perth office or our Melbourne or Gold Coast office, that you're going to get the same deliverables, the same fee, the same type of service that you would across the board. So that community is a really strong piece within our group nowadays. Well, and operationally, community is one thing, but one of the things that's been quite sub substandard in financial services is the power of brand Definitely. and brand association with different sorts of cohorts and whatnot. So, so having that consistency, and I did pick up you mentioned the word we a fair bit there. Yeah. So, um, not only have they become a uh, a business partner of yours, so to speak, and we might get into you know other things they do, but you intimated that 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 the buying power of them approaching the banks and uh, has allowed you, I suppose, a less friction-filled experience every time you've gone to acquire. Because anyone who's listening to this, who's gone to the banks, and a big shout out to the ones who lend money, the Judos, the Nabs and Macquarie's, it's still a punish yeah. doing the application. Yeah. So is that how they structure um, it? It is. Yeah, yeah, it has been. I think that uh, having done this four times now, I've kind of learned um, to structure it the most appropriate way I possibly could. So happy to pay a bit more for an acquisition, but if we're going to pay a bit more and the, the multiple's higher, I'm going to structure this deal over three payments. So the last one that I did in North Sydney was 50% upfront, um, 25% after 13 months and 25% after 26 months, um, which allowed us to get all of the cash flow on day one and start and pay down some debt. Uh, and then if clients dropped off or disengaged or passed away, that would impact the next payment and there'd be a clawback from the first. But did you keep the principle of the the acquired businesses on for a period of time? Was that part of the... Yeah, it varied. The one in 2018, uh, I kept him on for a year and that was too long for 52 clients after about... Um, it's one a week. Contractually, that's right. Yeah, contractually, um, uh, it got a 12-month contract um, with a good earnout. And uh, after I reckon about seven or eight months, he was starting to twiddle his thumbs. Yep. Um, the Hunter Valley practice was a five-month transaction. That was probably a bit short for the size of that business. There were a few more businesses. We're playing the maths game. Sounds like nine months is it. We are, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, it, it's somewhere from that six to 12 months, depending upon the number of the, the clients and the complexity of those clients. Yeah, perfect. And maybe just, uh, you know, to, to change gears, the org structure. So you've you've affectionately referred in, in directly to your advisors. Do you, do you Does each advisor run a pod or is it collective? Maybe get a, a feel <laughs> for how... Uh, each one of those deliver um, yeah. the vision, and and then also the types of clients that you've uh, that you the, you actually um, you know attract and want. Yeah, for sure. So you can do it in the other order, actually. Yeah. How does that sound? Yeah, I'll do that. So the the type of client that we're targeting nowadays, and not all of our clients look like this, but they've got established wealth of somewhere from 
10 million to 80 million dollars or they've got an income a taxable income of a million dollars a year or they're entrepreneurs on their way to the above and so, you've seen it before so you can sort of get a heat check on those the last part correct yep. yeah and we're really clear with our best of breed team our distribution our accountants lawyers bankers and the likes of uh, who we're looking for um, so they're the kind of clients that we uh, we tend to work with um, each pod would have a, a lead advisor. Mm -hmm. uh, and my goal is that they can walk into that boardroom, not write a thing down, walk out, and their second chair, who's always in the meeting with them, will then do a file note. They'll do the working papers, power planner handover, all of the compliance requirements. We're not 100% there just yet, but that's my goal. Is so, so, and the associate advisor concept, but you call them second chair, which I love that term yeah. actually. Yeah, yeah. So you've got the, the, the lead and then the second chair. Um, and that's made up. I've got one associate advisor who's aspiring to become a lead advisor. And then we've got two experienced client services officers. Uh, and they're there just to make sure that the advisor can walk in and walk out and the compliance is taken care of. And that's all from the Newcastle office because you've got a few different offices. Correct. So, yeah. yeah. So that's all from the Newcastle office. Whilst we've acquired two Sydney-based businesses, we've got offices down there on Spring Street, which we'll use when we go down there. The Hunter Valley practice came in uh, within uh, this practice. And as I mentioned, I sold the, the business on the Mid-North Coast uh, in 2009. So the central head office kind of is Newcastle. Uh, just as part of those pods there, supporting each of those pods, we've got an offshore with VBP. Um, so we've got actually two CSOs over there. Uh, we, we'll be looking for a third one very shortly. Um, but their their role is to do all the client meeting prep, build the slides. They do all the compliance checks, make sure everything's organized beforehand. Post meeting, they'll do, they'll actually build an ROA from the file note. Our power planner can build the advice. We're teaching her right now to build the advice from the file note. So we're trying to really kind of streamline that compliance process and the burden that's been placed upon us post royal commission. So, um, we've got a great, um, VBP power planner likewise across there. So that's a bit about the team. We've got one other, uh, we've got a, a Sydney based power planner likewise um, working with us. And um, it's been a big year taking on two practices this last year. We've, we've had a, a, a lot of new faces. So thankfully, my wife had sold her business a couple of years prior, not in the finance industry. She's a naturopath and aerobics instructor, and but very. I can see. Look at the face. Very look methodical. Look at the face. Look at, the, look at what we're dealing with here. <laughs> very detailed, very methodical, and that's not my skill set. I'm big picture. So um, it's been great to have her on board in this last 18 months to build processes. She's put everything onto Monday.com. We're on X Plan Threads. And um, just having that um, consistency in the processes is, is really helping us to ensure that we're doing it one way, same way. It wasn't as important, take you back five years ago when I'd got one pod, uh, but then when we acquired the Sydney-based business in 2018, we've got two pods. But now with three, it's important that they're all doing the same thing the same way and following that bouncing ball with the threads. So harking back to the beginning of our conversation, way back in the north of England, where you mentioned you're very target orientated and 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 very driven, um, and I, I do think um, you know a big burly football player coming up to a service uh, station attendant and pulling something out of their pocket is not probably something that I would recommend <laughs> in today's sort of society, um, but. With those pods that you've got, do you mind sharing maybe an idea of the revenue they're looking after, sort yeah, of, sure. you know, how that works? Because yeah. the engine room is all about creating an efficient way and a great platform for all the stakeholders, yeah. being the advisors, your team, but also the shareholders. Yeah, yeah, got it. So um, the target is for each pod to be managing revenue of about a million dollars. So my first two advisors are managing north of that right now. One of them's got too many clients. So this third pod that I've just created right now, um, Rachel's just come on board and we're transitioning about 30 clients from my second pod to the third pod to even out those numbers. And we'll do a bit of a renovation of those clients likewise and the revenue. But that's the goal is about a million dollars and about 70 to 75 clients. Um, and then, yeah, it's supporting that pod. You've got your second chair, you're offshore, um, financial planning assistant or CSO, and then the power plan is supporting them. And the, the stakeholders, um, you know, ideally receiving something between 20 and 35%. 
Correct. So we, we, we're targeting a 30% EBIT. In, in acquisition mode this last couple of years, we've been slightly below that. Is that because you've, you've got a, you're building a capacity cup that you've got to fill? It is. Yeah. You're building a bigger cup. You've got to take on more staff. Yeah. And then you've got um, a lot of de- due diligence, um, the, the legal bill, depending upon whether we bought the shares in the business or the assets of the business, was, would range from fifteen to $40,000. There's a tax bill. Um, so the, the DD, there's a few more extra expenses in, in yeah. that. Plus, yeah. let's, let's not take away from the fact that as, as the principal, you would be actively involved in those due diligence meetings, but that's also the time that you can't be the rainmaker to attract people as well. Correct. And that's the part that I love the most. I love working on the business, working with our distribution, supporting our lawyers, our accountants, um, and our other specialists, our business coaches, because they're the ones that support us. So, um, so this is uh, your funnel of people and of, of referral partners. Yeah. And, um, if I'm a if I'm a referral partner of yours, I'm an accountant or, or a business coach. Um, what's the, what's the cadence of you communicating with me? I'm go, we're going off piece here, but I know that a lot of people would like to to know. Yeah, you know what? Because you're out on our best of breed team, you're on our board of advice, supporting our clients. We're talking every week, right? So every week we've got clients that we're working on together that I've referred to you or vice versa. Um, I'm up in Brisbane in uh, next week actually with one of our accountants. And I've got a day seeing three families up there of his clients. And then he'll come down here in a couple of months and we'll, we'll do the same. We'll reciprocate. Yeah, right. So the takeaway is it's not just a referral that you go into your box and then you spit out the client back to them, etc. cetera. Um, you're creating a board of advice for, you know, as you say, a CFO strategy in yep. conjunction with their other professional advisors. Correct. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And it's horses for courses. We've got different accountants that suit different levels of complexity and different clients uh, in different um, industries. And, and the same with the lawyers likewise. Okay. Okay. And um, we went through um, your AFSL and a shout out to the FITS team. You, you speak very affectionately about them, but maybe give me a feel for um, a bit more of a feel of your tech stack across your business. Yeah, sure. So um, my source of truth for revenue is Monday. So I've got a dashboard on Monday that shows me how many clients each advisor is looking after, what the average revenue is, what their total revenue is. I can then break that down and see every client within there. We can see we've got a, a prospect board. So monday.com, it also holds all of our policies, our procedures, our videos. We've built a, a, a training model for our advisors to help take them from a white belt through to a black belt using the keep talking yeah using the um uh jujitsu or taekwondo karate and and, and martial arts analogy um so that in there we've got videos on there that would explain how we communicate asset protection how we communicate estate planning any of the different frameworks the soft skills or the hard skills how our investment approach works so you just just I suppose looping back. So you've built this or you're going to build this? We've built this. Yeah, we've so built this. if I'm a white belt coming into your business, regardless of associate paraplanner, yep. um, I can go to a library of on a self, self-serve self basis yep. in conjunction with my face-to-face learning. Correct. So th- this Very idea good. was born maybe a year or so ago. Um, and it was I, I'm sure it was from listening to a podcast uh, from another advisor who'd built something similar. Um, but we've now been building out and recording a lot of videos on all of the different frameworks that's going to get you from a yellow belt to an orange belt and from an orange belt to a brown belt and what you've got to do right the way through uh, and the different layers of complexity with those frameworks and we've got different coaches that will work with our team uh, to ensure that you can graduate from one belt to the next the the end result that we're looking for is we're going to have an app where you can actually self-paste and move through all of these different belts to to become a black belt and just, I suppose, to comment on church versus state, would this be something you do in conjunction with your licensee? If it's- it is, yeah. So whilst it was my brainchild, I'm hopeless at implementing. I'm, I'm, I like the ideas, the big picture, the visionary. When it comes to the detail and the implementation, I rang Terry Reed in WA, one of our coaches that works with all of our advisors. Shout out, Terry. Terry's awesome. She's been working with our group for 20-odd years um, from – all the way from receptionist right the way through to coach as she sits. The the end result we're looking for is that we've got an app and the advisors can work their way through each belt and graduate and, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's been a really crucial 
tool to help me engage and employ new people. So I've been chasing one advisor for about a year or so. And when I first called Rachel a year ago, she'd just moved. She was settled, didn't want to change again. And um, after two or three more phone calls, she gave me uh, the time to sit down and talk her through the advisor development tool white belt through black belt and it was a really cr- key and crucial piece of her coming on board was the the business that she was in locally didn't have any formal training of that sort or a plan uh, to help her develop and invest in her future i suppose one of the real positive benefits from ensemble is that people want to have the feel of a boutique advice firm they want to have the the closeness and community attachment of a small business but they do need the rigor of a larger organization and and from what you said um it'd be really interesting to to see the app and, and when it does get developed I'm, I'm sure that um if we could take a note there um uh, sound guy that that ensemble would be more than happy to um sort of showcase that because anything that's promoting the positive evolution sure. of financial advice yeah. um is is in our wheelhouse so yeah. on that i wouldn't mind just talking about the people and and um your your story, so you've got you're quite a few years in, and look, I suppose the first person I normally ask at this stage, why do people join? Why do they stay and why do they grow? But let's pick on the fact that your wife has been lassoed into this business after selling her her business, and she's very detailed, and she's done a fantastic job. Um, how is this a long term, or how are you going with with that interaction? Yeah, no, it's um, you know what we've both got very strong personalities, and whilst I love her to bits, I've met Melinda. You work, guys, yeah, I agree. Right. <laughs> working together has been a bit of a challenge, and she has done an awesome job of helping us get from A to B. But to get from B to C, I now need somebody that's got more experience in the industry that is more passionate about the industry she's a yogi and wants to walk around the office in bare feet and um, she's very woo woo so I need somebody now that's a bit more methodical that um, is a bit more passionate so that's somebody we're looking for as a practice lead and that's uh, located on the water in Newcastle correct in Newcastle okay yeah. we might we might pop that in the um, in, in one of the attachments as well and we might talk a bit more about that sort of at the end of uh, our podcast but um, uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, being different that's probably why you're attracted to each other correct that's right you know I often uh, when I'm talking about clients is that that um, couples don't marry themselves which is why quite often you've got a left brain and a right brain yeah and having seen your presentation previously in person about how you deal with clients um, the way in which you have uh, very detailed um, uh, workings for the left brain person and also very visual um, uh, interpretations as well hits the mark. So congratulations Thank on you. that. So, um, yeah, why do people join you? The recruitment process. I mean, you've got a very lean and deep relationship with your people. Um, where have you had your success in attracting people and, and is it replicatable? You know what? It's We're, we're still... We've been amateurs at this and we're still working on this and learning and, and it's something that um, I think I'm keen to explore more your ensemble uh, facility there where you've, you've got people that are looking to join organizations. So that's something that I was only talking to one of our other principals who's looking for advisors and associates just this week. An example, again, and, and I found Selena through Seek. Selena came on board and was attracted to our business with the training and the investment that, and the, the pathway that we built for her. The so, Chuck Norris program. A bit like that. So we sat down on day one and we talked about, well, what would make a great career for you? If we're sitting here in five years, paint me that picture. Uh, and it was about then aligning my business goals with her personal career goals. Um, six years later, having not managed a client back then, her top five clients are paying an average of 55000 a year. She's managing uh, numerous clients with north of $5 million. Uh, and she's a lead advisor looking after clients that are on the board of the ASX or their senior bank, bank executives. And it's been great seeing her learn and grow and develop. So I think that's one of the the secret herbs and spices that is attracting people to us has been um, just like Rachel is that learning and development that advisor development tool. And um, the type of personality. So, do you use any personality profiling tools at all? Or we we have done over the years, and Melinda takes that lead right now and that's above my pay grade as to exactly what she does uh with them but she does use um some some different personality tools yeah so i mean look they're 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 instructive but not not definitive is my my thoughts um and 
when you're with you with your actual uh, business, you've 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 attracted that um, uh, pe- various people and you've kept them. But uh, what does the office day look like? Are you are you a work from home? Are you a hybrid? Do you insist on everyone being there? If yeah. I was looking to work with you, what does my um, week or month look like? Sure. So look, everyone works from home two days a week. Um, we're all in the office on a couple of days a week, typically. So you make you you, you so the mandate that you do is when we're in, let's try and be in together. Correct. Yep. Yep. So to, culture is really important. We're going to spend thirty eight or forty hours a week together. So let's have some time together and and have some fun. That's really important is we've got a fun environment along the way. So we've got we're we're doing an escape room um, in a couple of weeks. Oh, we did one of them at Ensemble. <clears throat> you, okay, so yeah, they can be fun. <laughs> But they can be hard. Can they? <laughs> yes. Right. Well, all the partners are coming along that don't work together, so they'll be- They'll the be the team, team that'll win. They will, I'm sure. <laughs> and then there'll be, um, and I think it was Emily from Ensemble that shared that with Melinda at the VBP conference just recently. I was in the escape room with Emily. We got out and thought we'd killed it, but we probably had died 10 times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, that's one of the things. We've, we're flying our VBP team over in November for a week. They're going to stay at our place and they're going to experience the office office and have some more on-site face-to-face training. They'll be there for Melbourne Cup. We'll have our Christmas party. They love karaoke. So I'm sure that'll be on the agenda too. And look, one of the questions I ask is, um, you know, a lot of people have got um, uh, team members in Australia and all different places, but also, um, you know, increasingly as I do this engine room series, um, not just VBP, but many other, you know, professional providers um, have people overseas. And But you're been there a few times, but you're taking the step of bringing those people over. How many years have they been with you before you took that step? Because that's a reasonable financial commitment. Yeah, the, the longest one's five years, the, the the shortest one, Justine, two years. Um, so reasonable tenure. Yeah, reasonable yeah. tenure. Um, and um, you know what? Will approached me, um, it was the year before last, and he'd fallen in love with a, with a pommy girl. And he said, do you mind if I go and um, work from London for eight months of 2022? And it worked fine. You know, his his meetings were shifted to the afternoon, so it was pretty early for him. Um, and for eight months, he worked out of the Putney office, Fitzpatrick's Putney uh, in London. And uh, he got married um, only uh, a couple of months ago. And he said, can I go back for six or eight weeks? And he worked our hours, the Australian hours at that time. And um, and again, I don't mind as long as the clients are happy and we're getting the job done and, and it doesn't impact our culture. Um, I think it's great. You know, a, a couple of my staff this week have been under the pump and to let them work from home and not have to spend one of them spends an hour on the way and an hour on the way home she's been much more much happier and more settled investing that time and catching up than coming into the office i think we're all going to look back on um the discussions we're having around hybrid work from home you know in five or six years time and i imagine it'll, there'll be subjects at university on this yeah because the utilization of of your your labor your talent your biggest cost it's your biggest it's your biggest upside yeah um but I think the the real mature approach around um, being culture first works, provided that you've got some non negotiables. And and you mentioned that the team members have to be in. But but I was wondering what kind of meeting rhythm or cadences do you insist on um, as the leader of of, of the business, and yep. and how do they how do they work? So that was quite smooth, um, and we were using a few principles from the Rockefeller habits. So um, up until this last two acquisitions, we were having a daily huddle. Um, We'd have a monthly meeting, and um, we'd catch it with our offshores on a, a regular basis likewise. In this last year, it's not been a normal year. It, it's it, it almost broke a few of us. Um, we're probably, in hindsight, bit off more than I could chew. I was saying to my mate um, Boise in North Sydney for years, when you want to sell, give me a shout because I want to buy your business. Um, it just so happened that I was about three months into due diligence and negotiations with the Hunter Valley practice when Boise rang me and said, guess what, I'm good to go. And I said, mate, I, I can't do it this year in 2022. So we, we settled on him in February of 23. Um, but this year, this last year has not been your typical year. Um, so the, the daily huddle has kind of fallen by the wayside. We religiously have a meeting at 3 p.m. on a Monday. So our VBP team can be involved. They then each pod will have a meeting with their offshore 
member um, a couple of times a week. Uh, and we'll have a power planning meeting where all the advisors and second chairs are on there too. So we're still finding our feet with that with a few new faces on the back of a pretty exhausting year. I've got a sneaking suspicion that, that when this drops, you'll be committed to have to doing it. So yeah. this could be the reason. It's we'll like a see. New Year's resolution. You're back, baby. We'll see. So, um, but that's, I mean, having that, that cadence is, um, is quite important. And you mentioned um, how you, you have fun with your team, and we'll, we'll loop back on that. But um, how do you celebrate targets? So, for instance, um, do you have a sort of company targets as far as are they operational, are they revenue? What, what, are, the, what are the critical numbers yeah, that, that you, you obsess over? Yeah, so I, I share with my advisors the revenue and the EBIT of the business. Um, the advisors have a four-year long-term incentive in place. Um, so that, that that's based upon us hitting certain EBIT and revenue targets. So just to break that down, you've got a four-year program with your advisors. Yep. And EBIT's obviously a company-wide thing, yep. but they're in charge of their revenue silo. So how does that play? So uh, the, the difference that it's made is, yep, they're looking after – it's actually – there's clients in there sometimes that maybe have been a bit more demanding. They've been therefore a bit less profitable. And I'm, I'm finding that having that in place, the advisors are coming to me saying, you know what? This client's paying 10. They need to pay 20. So these are thousands, by the way, everyone. Yeah. Yep. And for, for me, I, I, I make that clear that I'm happy to lose that client if they're, um, being too demanding for the fee that they're paying and we're adding the value, they need to be paying what, what we're worth. So how do you coach that conversation? Clint? You know, it's, it's, it's a tough one. Uh, pricing, um, uh, it, it's about having the advisor having the conviction and the confidence to treat this business like their own and not give away time. So we, we, we're having to have some conversations in this last year have been increasing the lion's share of all of our clients' revenue uh, at their fees due to the fact that we've got a lot of operational costs increasing. Um, so it's been we've had to give them some coaching around that likewise, and we've got to make sure we're delivering and it's a win-win. And how many years through the four years are you? Have you just embarked on that or you've got a couple of months? We're towards the end of that for okay. two of them, yep. uh, and I've got one. Oh, so that's... a cascades. Correct, yep. yep. And I'll look to restart that again uh, and run for another four years before this next one finishes. And, and you know, one of the things is, you know, um, how do you retain people and how do you, you make them grow? And and, and spending the time and, and probably, you know, delaying gratification for the stakeholders, provided it's equitable, is, is, is what you've rolled out, correct? It is, correct. Yep. And um, while we're talking about fun, a lot of uh, businesses, um, you know, want to give back to, to the community, whether it be local or, or, or general, is um, – is, uh, does Fitz Newcastle run a charitable program or what, what what's – how does that operate within your ecosystem? Yeah. Part of the ethos of Fitzpatrick's is giving back. It's about community. We're very fortunate where we live and what we do. Um, and therefore, it's really important that we can contribute to causes and people that, that need support. So I'll give you a quick example. Our conference was in Vietnam a couple of years ago, um, and we organized to go to a restaurant called Koto, which is n uh, no one teach one, uh, where they would take kids off the street that were living under a bridge and they would teach them how to work front of house or back of house in a restaurant. And then that once they'd graduated, these kids would go off and they would work in great restaurants around the world. So um, we not only did we go there, but the group sponsored a, a few children. And our office, likewise, we sponsored um, one of the students there uh, for a couple of years, likewise. So that's one of the, the charities that we're quite passionate about. Um, we have a client, uh, Richie Harkham, who has the Harkham Foundation. His mission is to build 100 schools in communities around the world where the kids have been forgotten and it's hard to keep them in school and their child labour. What, what kind of countries are we talking? Um, Cambodia yep. is one of them right now. Um, and... Um, so at our conference last year in the Hunter Valley, Richie told his story, which was quite moving, uh, and shared his mission and his vision. Um, and um, having grabbed the microphone off him at the end of that, I just urged our advisors to put their hand in their pocket. And we reached out to a few fund managers, a school for him to build a school. It's $33,000. It's nothing, isn't it? It's not. Yeah. Um, we raised 90 odd thousand dollars um, at, at the end of that. Well, you've uh, just got yourself conference. a permanent mentor of 
every PNF foundation. <laughs> um, so uh, if he wants a side hustle, um, <laughs> I'm not going to give out his personal details, but um, can sell some lemmingtons. Definitely. And, you know, ph- ph- philanthropy is important to, to for us to educate our clients about that likewise. You know, we've got a lot of wealthy families and they don't need, their kids don't need all of the wealth that they're going to have. And mine are the same. Mine don't need what we're going to pass down. So we're going to set up a foundation that will come to life upon our death uh, and that will live on uh, on an ongoing basis. We have a lot of clients that have maybe large transactions. They've got a big tax bill and we can bring forward their philanthropic giving into one event to help them minimize tax and set up their own foundation. So Wow. And, and look, um, there might be some listeners here who... Uh, have um, earlier in their career and, and maybe don't have the, the wealth of those clients. But at what stage, what's the trigger event for a client-led philanthropic conversation, do you believe? You know what? You can you can join um, a group philanthropic fund with as little as $50,000. Right. So you, you're actually pooling that with other um, people and you can have some influence over where the donations go. To have a private or a PAF, a private ancillary fund, we're talking – um, half a million dollars um, as a minimum just due to the, the ongoing costs of that. Um, they've got to give away 5% year on year um, of the account balance as at 30 June. So a quick example, one of our clients came in maybe five years ago. He just sold a business for $33 million and he was quite philanthropic. They were giving away about $100,000 a year. He had a, a $1.6 million tax bill and um, we brought forward his, his their giving their structured giving, and um, we set up a foundation for three point one million dollars, and it negated their tax bill, effectively. So, um, so that's something that now will. Well, they uh, still gave the money away, but they had more of a personal touch on correct. where it went. Yeah, and now Will sits on the board of that foundation. Um, the two girls who are eleven and thirteen, they're on the board. They choose some of the charities as to where the the funds are going to go. They're getting educated about giving back, and it's great to see families doing that. So Fitzpatrick's, we have a foundation. We'll be in Japan in three weeks' time, and I'll be leading the charge um, to support Oz Harvest, is one of our uh, organisations this year, as well as the Harkham Foundation and a local Japanese um, orphanage over there. You mentioned Fitz many times. Maybe um, and, and this is going over and above talking about your engine room, but, but due to your passion about it, what, what's what's the scale of Fitzpatrick's? How many advisors are we talking? Right now we've got about 50 advisors. Um, you know what? Over the years um, we took on some advisors that maybe weren't – that didn't fit the family photograph. Um, we were looking for more of a scale business back then, but that's starting to consolidate a bit more now. Um, now that we're forming this national partnership, a few – businesses that we'd taken on maybe weren't looking at the ideal client that we were wanting to work with uh, or charging uh, the, the revenue or providing the service that was congruent across the businesses. So there's probably about 50 right now. We might see that shrink slightly because we're looking for a, a very specific partner um, if someone's going to join the business. And um, I had the, the pleasure of watching you present um, in front of a crowd of a couple of hundred um, only recently about how you deal with clients. And although this is the business of the business, I think that, um, you know, the, the granularity of, of, of how you do it, you do a mind map, maybe give us a sort of, if I'm paying you $50,000 per annum as a client, yeah. um, what are the things that, that I'm getting for that? Um, sure. Because we're going to have some aspirational people who like that first number, yeah. but you earn your money. Definitely. Yeah. And, and you know what? You've got to charge appropriately when you're going to be uh, providing this kind of a family office or a lead advisor service. It's not going to work if you're charging less than $20,000 a year. So if we look at the types of clients that we're working with nowadays, I'll give you a quick example. The last three or four that we've engaged over the last few months, they get referred to as by their accountant or their lawyer or a banker um, or an existing client. And uh, the first part is to have a good look at where the weaknesses are in their current situation or structure. So we want to have a look at all of their estate plans, all of their structures, their org chart for their their um, companies and trusts. We want their constitutions, their trust deeds, 
Um, we want to have a look at all, all their insurances, their superannuation. And f once we've got all of that, we're going to put that together on an A3 page, an advice map. And I've got to give credit to Jim Stackpool for, for this framework that he taught us when he was coaching me. So we want to see their entire life on a page. Um, at the initial meeting, the context is to get really clear about what would make a great life for you as a client. So I want to take you forwards 10 years and I want you to paint me that picture. Where are you living? What are you doing? How much income do we need? What are your financial milestones? What do you want to give back? If you weren't here yesterday, what did it all mean? What's your legacy? Um, so they're the kind of things that we want to be understanding and getting really clear about what that looks like and why that's important. We're then going to take you forward three years from now. What's got to happen for you to be on track for your 10-year milestones in three years. What are some of the milestones that need to happen there? And then in 12 months, what are we got to achieve together in the next 12 months? What kind of plans or advice do we need to provide? So it's execution time. It is for you to nail your 12-month milestones. So they go on the top right-hand corner of our advice map, along with the family tree, along with their other advisors, their income assets, liabilities, insurance structures, Everything's on this one page because these clients typically have a fair bit of complexity. Their typical wealth, as I mentioned, is somewhere from 10 million to 80 million dollars. So once we and we charge an initial fee to put that together, and that might be three to six thousand dollars, we're going to come back and we're going to report back to you and say, you know what, you've got a, a family trust, and here's the risks from an asset protection standpoint. You've got estate plans that aren't going to keep your wealth within the family bloodlines. You're, um, we need to work out if you're on track or off track to achieving your financial milestones. So we put together a, a PowerPoint slide deck that would help communicate, here's the weaknesses around um, that's going to stop you from getting to where you, where you need to. And here are the opportunities likewise. And then here's our scope. For the next 12 months, we're going to charge you $30,000, for example, and we're going to meet more than likely six times, seven times. We're going to collaborate with all of your other advisors. We're going to get everybody on the same page and make sure that if we, if we've got an advisor or somebody on your team there that's not A grade, because often clients will build a business and they don't know when to let go. They're quite loyal to an accountant or a lawyer or a banker. And sometimes we come across professionals that are B grade and there's things missing that, that just aren't adding value. Well, sometimes their family members aren't appropriate for the roles they're in. Correct. That's right. So we want to work out, is there a financial flat tire happening somewhere there that's going to slow us down? And it once the client understands, okay, well, I really should have a family trust owning the equity in my business, or I should have this asset owned in this particular structure. Often we get asked for an introduction to somebody from our best of breed team. And over the last 27 years, we've worked with the best and the worst of other professionals, and we've put together our best of breed team, and we will bring in a professional that will help solve that problem. So, uh, that's the kind of initial process is we'll put together the advice map. We'll charge a one-off fee. Give us a month. We'll come back and we'll show you where the chinks in the armor are. And that, that, and at that stage, if they just don't like what you're cooking, well, that you've, you've charged a cost recovery. And, but I doubt that happens very often. You know what? That there's not a lot of profit in that initial $5,000. Yeah, it's cost recovery. It Correct. is. It's yeah. purely just to work out, are you a match for us? And what have we got to do to add value? Yep. And um, and then once once they're on that journey, um, because you've got the ten year, the three year, and the one year philosophy, every time you elapse a year, you trigger the same correct. We review that, so we want to check in because that's why they're engaging us. They're not engaging us for the salary sacrifice strategy or whatever it might be, the recontribution strategy. They're engaging us for whatever's on the top right hand corner of their advice map, and that's I want to put the kids through university, or I want to go and spend a year living in Cinque Terre, or this is the lifestyle that I want and they're engaging us to maximize the probability of them achieving that and help them navigate the potholes and the landmines along the way. One of the great um, things of being exposed to many, many financial planning businesses, financial <laughs> services businesses in my various roles, is that there's no, there's no right one. We, we interview people that have got 100 
employees and they're mid market and they're doing very well. We we talk to companies that are specific with the the industries um, that they get their clients from, and we talk to, with 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 practitioners such as yourself who are hyper specialised. And and for those of you listening who are, are embarking on a career in this industry, um, definitely uh, figure out what what suits you. You know, if you're if you're a really deep um, interpersonal uh, relationship person who likes complexities, there might be one. If you like the, the the thrill of maybe dealing with a lot of people at once, and that's the beauty of financial planning in, in 2023. I think we we've we've worked it out. Um, we probably were accelerated through various things. I think the the GFC probably woke us up, and the the Royal Commission, uh, you know, <laughs> put us to sleep, then woke us up again. So um, it works really well. And if I was to ask you um, the vision for the future of financial um, services companies and not just your one but where do you see uh, you know a good tapestry of offering that is going to be professional and respected by the the general public sure the, the one thing that's kind of evolved since the royal commission is that it's become harder and harder for single man your one man bands your smaller practices to offer a profitable service they need scale they need uh, to leverage their time and let go of some of the the things that they've got to do like compliance um, to other people that are better off doing that so they can focus more time on giving advice. So again, if I, I bring you back to our model where I want each of our advisors managing at least a million dollars of revenue, not making the file notes or doing the power planner handovers, the goal is that they can walk in, give advice and walk out. So that model would look like a senior advisor. There might be two associates straddling each meeting, jumping across each meeting, an offshore CSO managing them. In a perfect world, this business, you know, we're generating 30 to 35% EBIT. Um, and that there's no reason why with that model, um, with the right kind of infrastructure, you couldn't be turning over $10 million. So that you know, would just be, you've got to find another four or five open-minded people to lead as lead advisors, correct, yeah. and that's the biggest. Are you challenge. in the market for lead advice? We're always in the market for. for so, so I've just done the numbers. Yeah, it sounds like you're short one associate advisor. We are right now. Yeah, yeah. So well, actually, uh, what I've got right now is um, I've got a couple of my advisors spending too much time with those power planner handovers and some of those admin functions that are the compliance functions. Yeah. So uh, I, it would be perfect to have another associate that could come on board and help leverage their time so you've heard it here first uh the the fits uh, newcastle business um is in the market for an associate advisor as well we might we might put that into the the talent hub i think kieran yep let's do that um and maybe you know flesh out the the national advisor network so so you're clearly um uh, so Fitzpatrick's part of you and you're part of them. Do you, do you operate in any sort of advisory capacity with that business? Do I operate, sorry? Any, any kind of advisory capacity with the Fitz yes, business? Yes, yeah, yeah. So I've got a board. Um, John yep. Woodley sits on my board. We'll catch up every quarter. Um, I did have another coach, Greg Gunther, sitting on my board for a period of time just to bring some independent governance to the business. Um, Greg stepped down and he's still a coach for us and he still coaches a lot of our clients. Um, Greg and Josh, and a shout out to them, Your Business Momentum. They're amazing coaches that support financial planning and lots of other different businesses likewise. But um, they they both started in financial advice, built businesses, sold them, uh, and they are down in Newcastle supporting a lot of our local business owners, helping them get really well organized. Um, but they uh, they still kind of sit on my board unofficially. Um and we likewise sit on boards of other clients' businesses. So we just engaged a, a, a client who's uh, based out of Newcastle, turning over about $10 million a year with businesses in London, uh, and he lacks a bit of governance. So I'm sitting down with him and building his 90-day rocks, his 12-month game plan, his three-year milestones, and uh, holding him accountable. And, I, and if, I, if I sort of go back to the very beginning, so you're a professional athlete, and obviously you had coached, you were coached. Um, right now, uh, for someone to meet you, you've, you're an A-type personality. But throughout the the last, um, throughout this whole podcast, you've you've very respectfully referenced a lot of people who've coached you over the years. And and, and um, what's been, you know, is there any advice on on people out there as far as being coached? Because clearly, you're a fan of it, and it's it it flows through from your very beginning of your your, your story. It does, yeah, yeah. Um, we have had Brian Fitzpatrick fly down 
um, from Bogangar, which is near Cabarita, every six months. Um, he's retired now. He's a client of ours. Um, but Brian had a massive influence on uh, the direction of our business, and he helped us with emotional intelligence and coaching. Um, he's handed the baton to Terry Reed and Paul Crane, who are also coaches within the business, and they – spend a lot of time with our advisors around the soft skills. Those that, that advisor development journey that we talked about, um, they lead the charge in educating our advisors around frameworks like Red, Blue, Black from Sherlaw's or the stages yep. model yep. or um, just other emotional intelligence to help our advisors move kind of below the line. Most advisors, we tend to find it's natural to spend time up in all the numbers, but very, very seldom do they go below the line and look at the emotional and spiritual and work out, well, you know, why is that important to you that you want to take your kids overseas for a year or educate them or give back? or And that's where the, the magic happens, we find, is when we're going below that line in the uh, with emotional intelligence. And that, that has to start at the grassroots because ASIC and the regulators have, have, have completely ignored that Correct. in everything they've done. And do you have any best of breed shout outs? Because, you know, you've got an aspirational business. Is there any, uh, anyone who you, uh, see out there in, in our, our ecosystem that you like? Sure, definitely. Yeah, look, as part of our best of breed team from a tax standpoint, Josh Meggs, Pilot Partners in Brisbane, he is our go-to for clients that are turning over, um, say, north of $3 million. Um, he, from a, a, a technical standpoint, you're not going to better meet a better technical um, and, and a great communicator than Josh. Um, from an asset protection, estate planning, Fran Becker, Hamilton Lock again in Brisbane. They're a national law firm. They were the, the fastest growing law firm last year. And we're building a, a national partnership with them right now. I mentioned Greg and Josh are from Your Business Momentum. Um, amazing coaches. Um, and then AFRM, they handle a lot, lot of our insurance, our personal insurances. So they're the, the key ones that we tend to work with that sit on our best of breed team. Look, I, I love the fact that you um, wanted to make sure that 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 you gave shout outs to people who've helped you on their journey, and I, I get the feeling that there's a warmth um, with with all your, your personal interactions, as there is not only today but in my previous interactions with yourself. I'd like to take the time to thank you for being on the engine room. Um, you don't know how much this means to the listeners um, because they're taking little nuggets of gold. So, with that, I'd like to thank on behalf of Ensemble for a, a rollicking good time and. Um, Welcome to the engine room. Thanks, Roxy. It's been a pleasure.